1860s and the Civil War was raging. And it was a time when medicine was still in the Dark Ages. There was no concept of a germ theory yet. A hospital is a place you want to die. A young woman, Glory. Ellen White, had a vision, she claimed from God, for a new understanding of health and healing. It became one of the cornerstones for a new American-born religion, the Seventh-day Adventists. Today, Adventists operate some of the nation's leading hospitals. One of the key ways that we thought we would make history is to create the community hospital of the future. Explore the latest medical technology. To the trained eye, he has an aneurysm right here. Expand on the pioneering work of infant heart transplants. In fact, we can take his heart out, put a new heart in. There's something miraculous about all that. Practice a body, mind, and spirit approach to health and healing. Even the curriculum in medical school is changing to incorporate a more holistic view. And the irony is that Adventists, who believe in the near end of the world, are now among the healthiest and longest living people on the planet. Well, I'm 98 years young. They live anywhere from five to up to 10 years longer. It's pretty exciting. About one hour east of Los Angeles is Loma Linda, California. It's an enclave for the Seventh-day Adventist Church with a world-class medical center and a university with a focus on health and medicine. Loma Linda came to world attention in 1984 when Dr. Leonard Bailey transplanted the heart of a baboon to save the life of a dying child, a child that became known as Baby Fay. At the time, the operation was highly controversial. Lynn faced some real opposition from our own campus. I mean, some people who weren't sure that we wanted to be this exposed, that we weren't sure this was the right way to go. And I credit for Lynn for keeping clear in the vision of where he was going. I do believe that the scars that Lynn got during this time have made him the gentleman that he is. Today, Dr. Bailey and Loma Linda surgeons perform as many as two dozen infant heart transplants a year. But Loma Linda and the wider Adventist community are making headlines again. There are about one million Adventists in the United States, and as many as 100,000 of them have been the subject of a number of long-term studies, supported mostly with federal funds, to understand why Adventists seem to enjoy a longer life expectancy. 10% of how long we live is dictated by our genes. The other 90% or so is dictated by our lifestyle. Dan so Buettner led a research project for National Geographic that turned into a best-selling book, The Blue Zones. It identified Loma Linda as one of a handful of locations around the world where people do in fact live longer and seemingly healthier lives. I was in collaboration with the National Institute on Aging and um, some scientists out of Harvard. They put us in touch with the people who run the Adventist Health Study, which is a gold standard NIH-funded epidemiology study that follows tens of thousands of people for decades. And that study revealed that the Adventists who most strictly follow the suggestions of the church are living about a decade longer than their American counterparts. But it's not simply living longer. Can the later years also be happy and productive? Ellsworth Wareham is as close to a poster child for Loma Linda and the Adventist lifestyle as there is. He insists on doing many of his own home projects, but it's his day job that continues to amaze. At age 95, Dr. Wareham can still be found most days in the operating room, not as a patient, but as a critical member of a team performing open heart surgery. I was the primary surgeon until I was about 76. Then I started to assist. Some weeks I'll assist in five or six open heart operations. The matter of assisting, of course, is quite simple after you've been a surgeon yourself. And it's the easiest thing I do. Ellsworth Wareham was an icon when I was a medical student here 35, 40 years ago, and still is. And, but, but it's not his technical expertise as much as his person. 
If you're doing heart surgery and vascular surgery, you get to see the results of your eating habits. It appears now, if you're going to be interested in longevity and good health, there better be a strong emphasis of plant-based food. People oftentimes ask me about stress and its influence on coronary artery disease. It's a nice concept that stress <laughs> has caused me to have your coronary artery disease, but it most likely came off your plate. <laughs> it is pretty accepted now in the medical community with all of the body of scientific research that has been looking at Adventists that they live longer than their peers. They live longer than the people who are living in neighboring towns and even people living next door to them. The initial studies of Adventists were looking at specific things in their lifestyle. They found that because they're vegetarian, they eat more nuts. So originally we were saying in the early 1990s, hey, let's all eat walnuts, let's all eat almonds, which is a good first step. But with the Adventists, it's much more holistic. It's their whole vegetarian lifestyle, which includes a lot of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. But it's also beyond that. They believe in a strong sense of community. Well, I'm 98 years young. I am blessed because I have a church family. Well, I think we're content. I think that, I think contentment means a lot. Six, seven, give me four. Out. They believe in exercise. Four. Great five. I come five days a week. I don't eat meat. I haven't for close to 40 years. I am over 70, so well over 70, so <laughs> that's as close as you're gonna get. <laughs> you get around people that don't smoke, that don't drink, you just get a different frame of mind. We have a number of people who come for proton treatments, and they come, they, while they're here, the three months or however, they come regularly, many of them. Proton treatments, for people mostly suffering some form of cancer, who come to Loma Linda. They stay for a month or longer, for daily treatments in the proton accelerator, a revolutionary process that splits the atom to more precisely target cancerous growths. It's one of the paradoxes within the culture of Seventh-day Adventists. For on one end of the campus is the church for a religion founded by a 19th century woman, Ellen White, a religion that by its own description is rather conservative with a traditional biblical understanding of creation and a firm belief in Advent, meaning coming, and in this case, the imminent second coming of Christ. Yet across the same campus, Seventh-day Adventists are on the cutting edge when it comes to medical science and holistic health. I think what makes Loma Linda so unique is this attempt to ride the line between both faith and science, in which we actually see faith as complementing, directing, and strengthening science, not as something we're trying to put back or, or, or leave behind. Love one another, care for one another, forgive one another, support one another. It is all the way through the New Testament. One we take the Bible very seriously. I think that we are conservative as far as most people are, are concerned. Uh, we have a lifestyle that is conservative, not as conservative as it once was. Most people, when they hear about Adventists, they have the foggiest notion of what an Adventist is. I have to admit, I'm most uh, pretty ignorant about Seventh-day Adventist Church. I have heard of them, but I don't know their backstory at all. I don't think I have a clue. <laughs> we identify ourselves as Christians. We identify ourselves as Protestants. I've heard of them. I don't know what they stand for. Adventists don't drink alcohol. They don't smoke. Are you a Mormon? Are you the people that come knock on the door with the watchtower? No, we're not Mormons. Uh, what do you believe? Well, we believe that Jesus is coming again. So I think they follow the Jewish tradition in saying that Saturday is the Sabbath. We've been described as a people, uh, ironically, expecting the soon return of Christ, and yet who are, are known for doing all sorts of things to try to improve life here and build it up in a positive way. That sense of building in a positive way is even more ironic, considering Adventists grew out of an historic event more than a century and a half ago that came to be known as the Great Disappointment. And Daniel had a vision, a vision from God. 
And he said, I was frightened and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, your wisdom belongs to the end of time. In the mid-19th century, a Baptist preacher, William Miller, traveled the country preaching that the second coming of Christ was close at hand. Tens of thousands believed he was right. The pivotal text that William Miller centered his apocalyptic lectures on was Daniel 8:14, Unto 2,300 days, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Cleansed! And he thought the sanctuary was the earth, and it would be cleansed by the fires of the second coming. Miller's followers determined the cleansing would come on a single date, October 22, 1844. One of those who came to hear Miller speak was a young woman, Ellen White. And at that time, Ellen White, my great-grandmother, and the whole family went to hear him. They were all impressed. Uh, they were impressed by his sincerity, his knowledge of the Bible, his understanding of prophecy, and his ability to explain things clearly and, and succinctly. Described by the Holy Scriptures, cleansing by fire. As October 22nd approached, true believers prepared to meet their God. Farmers abandoned their crops and livestock. Shop owners closed their businesses. Others simply threw away their money. And that night people gathered and waited to be united with their God. But the next morning, Ellen White and the others awoke to a world unchanged. She believed with her whole heart that Jesus was coming. She writes in her own writings, I went home and I cried all night. I think the disappointment of those earnest believers knew no bounds. And of course, mobs gathered about their places of worship to, to mock them and intensify their misery. And that term, the great disappointment, is, is widespread among Adventists. It was a reality that still exists, I think, within the community. He did not come. And that, I think, undergirds the whole idea of the importance of the body. God didn't come back but we've got one another, and God says he's with us in this body. As Ellen White sought to understand what the disappointment meant, she had visions. Over her lifetime, she is said to have had 2,000 visions, which Adventists believe came directly from God. Those visions would help chart a course for the new church. She would often faint on the floor They'd put a pillow under her head, and she would be seemingly out of it. They would test, and the, they couldn't see that she was breathing. And then she would come out of these and start saying what she had seen. In 1863, she had what is known in, in my circles as the comprehensive health vision that outlined a deeper commitment and uh, to bodily health and an understanding of the close relationship between bodily health and spiritual wholeness. This vision on health was actually quite encompassing. It talked about a plant-based diet, it talked about the need for sunshine, about the need for exercise, cleanliness, about the need of reducing sugar and increasing uh, vegetables and fibers in the, in the diet. But for those early Adventists, this was a major lifestyle change. And even for Ellen White, I mean, her favorite food was meat and white bread. The vision came at a time when the life expectancy was just over 40, and doctors could get a degree with little or no study. The condition of medicine was appalling. Basically, it was buyer beware. If you went to the doctor, the most common prescription you were given often contained things like drugging, bleeding, leeching, and even prescribing of smoking if you had a problem with coughing. In fact, the most common prescription 
was, when you begin coughing, smoke two cigarettes immediately. Medicine in the mid-19th century was based on adjusting the bodily fluids. Bleeding was a, uh, well, you know, if, if, if you got too much body heat, you know, you just bleed off a pint of the stuff. If that didn't work, you try two pints. And then also, uh, you could take medicines, often that can, in fact, generally contain both arsenic and mercury, and they would definitely flush out your system, fore and aft. <laughs> no rich person in the 19th century went to, a, went to a hospital. They had a physician come to them, because without germ theory, you died in a hospital. Despite the public's fear of health institutions, in 1866, three years after it formed, the new Adventist Church opened the Western Health Reform Center in Battle Creek, Michigan. It became an instant success because so few people were dying. Soon, a brilliant young surgeon, John Harvey Kellogg, whose medical education was sponsored by Ellen White, became director. Kellogg changed the name to the Battle Creek Sanitarium and over the next half century built an empire around the evolving Adventist approach to medicine and healthy living. Kellogg is the man who chose the word sanitarium because what he wanted is a place where people come to learn how to get healthy and to stay healthy. People were getting fresh air, sunlight, patients who were taking walks, and he understood the benefit of the natural healing effects that were available in the environment, coupled the best of science with the best of what we can get naturally, and really did something that revolutionized care in his day. Through the years, Kellogg's reputation as an eccentric personality was only enhanced by his passion for new ways to harness nature for diet and health. He experimented with heat treatments, and hydrotherapies. Scores of celebrities came to Battle Creek, including President William Howard Taft, King Edward, inventor Thomas Edison, pilot Amelia Earhart. Kellogg Sanitarium was now the largest health institution in the world. These rich people came because they wanted to feel better. It was very pragmatic. Uh, we know that these Adventists can do what we can't get elsewhere. And this was a tremendous boon to the Adventist health work. Adventist sanitariums began springing up across the country. But when the Great Battle Creek Sanitarium burned to the ground in the early part of the 20th century, Kellogg wanted to rebuild it on an even grander scale. A rift developed between the powerful Kellogg and church leaders. In the end, John Harvey Kellogg who patented a process for making peanut butter, is credited with helping to inspire a national exercise movement, and who with his brother created a name synonymous with the breakfast food industry, broke from the church, but not before helping to put the Adventist approach to health and the creation of unique health facilities on the map. Florida Hospital admits 110,000 patients a year. We take care of uh, over a million patients in our outpatient settings and in our emergency rooms. And we operate on 150,000 people a, a year. We have become the largest admitter in the United States, the hospital that admits more patients than any other in the U.S., and also America's largest provider of Medicare services. Florida Hospital is not one hospital but a system of seven campuses across Greater Orlando. The newest project is a 400-bed wing that overlooks a lake to combine the healing power of nature with state-of-the-art medicine. It's called Ginsburg Tower, named for a key benefactor. Knowing it's a Seventh-day Adventist hospital and that my own particular faith is Jewish, I wanted to be sure that when you walked in the door, you were walked into a building whose professionals are here to cure you, not to convert you. There are more cardiac procedures done in this hospital than any place in America. And I also assume someday I'll be having my own heart attack, and I, and I want to be right here at, uh, in this building. It's wonderful to have this hospital wing here. Hope to gosh you never need it as a, as a patient. Very good. 
Hospital in America have faced one major problem. Nobody wants to go there. So how can you change the health of America if you're the last place people want to go and the first place they want to leave? It's just not a good way to go at things. And so we tried to create a place where we could heal the whole person throughout their whole life, both in sickness and in health. The idea of a hospital as a place in sickness and in health was built into the original design of one of Florida Hospital's most unique facilities, Celebration Health. Opened in the late 1990s, it's the health center for the community also known as Celebration. Originally designed by Disney as a model for the 21st century, Disney turned to the Adventists to partner with them in the creation and design for a new hospital. Embodied in the entire building, from the architecture, the feel of the place is all about wellness. When you drive up to hospitals ordinarily, you feel sicker than you already felt when you were actually coming in. We wanted people to begin their healing experience or their health experience from the time they actually drove in. And so when you look at the building, you feel really more like you're in a spa versus being in a hospital. Just off the entrance, what they like to call the front stage, the focus is on staying healthy. There is a pool and a fitness center used by hospital patients, doctors, staff, and the wider community. But it's on the backstage where Celebration takes on the character of a traditional hospital. Here, the notion of community, central to most religions, is woven into the prescription for healthcare, as doctors often bring an entire team on morning rounds. We have a chaplain, we have our respiratory therapist, the dietary physical therapy, and it could vary between 10 to 15 to 20 people involved in the care. The team allows us to provide a more comprehensive care to the patient, you know, we can harness the skill of different people. And the notion of community also plays a role in how patients advance their own recovery. And this has all been scientifically shown that people do better when they're in a community. Um, we have become more isolated with our technology, but yet being able to interact with people, especially people who have gone through similar experiences as your own, give you feelings of hope. Our transportation service will help you get into the vehicle, so you don't have to stress out about that. I was hoping you'd say that. Yeah. <laughs> I love my husband, but he's not exactly the most gentlest person. <laughs> when you see somebody who's had more extensive work than you have, and they're working twice as hard, and not getting anywhere near like where you're at, you'd be embarrassed to not do something about it. Yay! Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Doctors more and more are starting to realize that there's a lot that they don't know about the human body. There's a lot that they don't know about healing. And I think that is where, you know, spirituality comes into play. You know, they know that if a patient feels connected to other people, that helps in their healing. But they don't understand well, what is the actual mode of action? What's what's that doing to the immune system? And that makes them a little nervous. You know, they want to always know exactly how everything works. Maybe it's okay just to know that what it does makes that person feel good, relieves their stress, and that's enough. Linda Lynch is a chaplain at Florida Hospital. In a system that believes in the connection between body, mind, and spirit, her domain is the spirit, primarily for women and infants. It means she works with many of the expectant mothers. I think one of my primary roles is to put them at ease, to come as a spokesperson for the hospital, and in my mind, more than a spokesperson for the hospital, a spokesperson for, for God. And so my presence, hopefully my manner, is just to lend to the beginning calm so that they can begin. Tonight, Yolanda Robinson is about to give birth to her third child. Push hard in your bottom. That's good, the push. Good, 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 good push. Good, 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 good,
Oh, he's coming, cuz. Yes, he's coming. Perfect. Good. Hey, darling, keep going, keep going, keep going. Ooh. There he is. All right. Oh, yeah. I oh. oh, hey, man. Okay. You Auntie, come back. Oh, oh, my God. Get him. I'm trying to. So there. Welcome to our world. This really is a precious moment for every mom. If the mom is strong, if the baby is strong, they're leaving shortly in, in less than 48 hours. But some births are more complicated. Nikki Floyd broke her back in an accident while 40 weeks pregnant. The baby is taken by cesarean section and brought immediately to the neonatal intensive care unit. When any of us see suffering in a child, it calls forth from us questions about what it is to be human. It calls forth our helplessness, our vulnerability to see the tiniest, most fragile human beings still